God is our light, our salvation, and our hope. Lift up your head and see the bright light of love. We will go seeking the face of God. Stand firm and trust this promise. God is with us now. The New Testament lesson is taken from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 17 through chapter 4, verse 1. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For, as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, the, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. The gospel lesson is taken from the book of Luke, chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox, I will keep on driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow, and on the third day I will reach my goal. In any case, I must press on today and tomorrow and the next day, for surely no prophet can die outside Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The word of God for the people of God. During Lent, we remember the events that led up to the crucifixion. Jesus had come to bring hope and light to the world, but at every step, there were those who willingly tried to put out that light. He brought grace and forgiveness, but these gifts were often rejected by those filled with hatred and fear. We read in the Gospel of Matthew, in the 12th chapter, it was the Sabbath, and Jesus went to a synagogue where there was a man with a paralyzed hand. Some people were there who wanted to accuse Jesus of doing wrong, so they asked him, Is it against our law to heal on the Sabbath? Jesus answered, What if one of you has a sheep? and it falls into a deep hole on the Sabbath. So then, our law does allow us to help someone on the Sabbath. Then Jesus said to the man with the paralyzed hand, Stretch out your hand. The man stretched out his hand, and it became well again, just like the other one. 
Then the Pharisees left and made plans to kill Jesus. Even when Jesus was healing, there were those who could not accept the power and mercy of God. As the Pharisees left to make plans to kill Jesus for healing on the Sabbath, a little of the light which had come into the world was snuffed out by people Jesus had come to save. Let us pray. Protector God, gather us under the wings of your love. Strengthen us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Shine with the bright wisdom of Christ that we may hear your word and walk in your ways. All of these things we ask in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. My uh, sermon topic this morning is entitled, It is Always the Third Day. Always the Third Day. Now we, need this, uh, we know the story well. You see, Jesus was journeying toward Jerusalem. And when he arrived in the capital city, he'd be welcomed with a great parade. The crowd along the main street would cheer, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, a few days after that, the crowd would turn on Jesus, and he'd face a trial, a crucifixion, death, and burial. Then on the third day, Christ would be raised from the dead, and on the third day, there would be new life. As Amos Wilder, a distinguished Harvard New Testament professor and scholar, wrote, retell, renew the event in these planetary years. For we were there, and he is there. It is always the third day. Always the third day. Now hold that thought, that promise, right there in the front of your mind. It's always the third day. At least it seems that way, doesn't it? As Jesus and the apostles walked toward Jerusalem, the group stopped every now and again for Jesus to preach the gospel, heal the sick, and cast out demons. Now, by necessity, these stops were brief because Jesus had a meeting scheduled with destiny in Jerusalem. In a quiet moment at one of these stops, a group of Pharisees alerted Jesus to impending danger. They said, get away from here. For King Herod wants to kill you. Get away from here, for King Herod wants to kill you. Luke's gospel doesn't mention the Pharisees' motivation. It may have been heartfelt. The Pharisees may have heard of a plot against Jesus and simply wanted to warn him. But on the other hand, their motive may have been a lot more sinister. Maybe they were threatened by Jesus and wanted to, wanted to kind of move him along. Get away from here. For Herod wants to kill you. As background information, let's remember that there's more than one king named Herod. Now at the time of Jesus' birth, Herod the Great was king. When the Magi stopped to ask for directions so they could visit the baby boy born the king of the Jews, Herod the Great ordered the deaths of all baby boys under the age of two. Now, infant genocide was this Herod's method of getting rid of perceived rivals. Herod the Great was an especially vicious fellow. Now, his grandson, Herod Agrippa, was known for extravagant spending on himself, being excessively greedy, taking bribes, and colluding with the Romans. 
Agrippa became king by falsely accusing his uncle of being disloyal to Caligula, the Roman emperor. Now, like his grandfather, Herod Agrippa was not a nice person. Agrippa's uncle, King Herod Antipas, was a ruler during the ministry of Jesus. Antipas was the Herod who had John the Baptist arrested and beheaded. He was also instrumental in the trial of Jesus. As with his father and nephew, Herod Antipas had a bad reputation as well. Evil seemed to run in that family, didn't it? Now when the Pharisees told Jesus, get away from here, Herod wants to kill you, they might have been literally referring to Herod Antipas. On the other hand, they may have been using the name as shorthand for the usual bad behavior of all of the local rulers. Whatever their motivation, and to whomever the Pharisees referred, Jesus responded to their warning to get out of town by saying, go tell that fox, go tell that fox. Now today, to call someone a, quote, fox is to say something positive. For example, wow, that is one foxy lady. <laughs> or perhaps, he's a fox, he's a fox. That's not true here, however. Almost always the Bible portrays the fox in a negative light. The reason's obvious. A fox is physically beautiful, inarguably, but it's also a vicious, sneaky, tricky, unrelenting predator. The fox leaves a trail of destruction and death in its wake. Now to paraphrase Jesus' response to the Pharisees' warning, go tell that vicious, predatory old fox that I'm occupied with other matters today and tomorrow, but remember this, the third day will come. The third day will come. No matter how threatening the world might be today and tomorrow, life's cruel ways will not last. Resurrection is coming. New life comes on the third day, and it's always the third day. Within the short dialogue is also a magnificent simile of Jesus' love, not only for the residents of Jerusalem, but a simile of God's love for all people. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. Many, if not most of us, have no firsthand experience of the behavior Jesus described. Our personal experience with chickens is limited to freshly packaged chickens at the grocery store or those cooked and ready to eat from Colonel Sanders at KFC. Jesus' audience, however, knew chicken behavior. Now, for thousands of years, they, chickens, not people, were raised in the backyard. People lived with chickens. They watched them every day. They had watched hens react to impending threat. For instance, when a fox first came into view, the hen started to bring her chicks under the shelter of her wings. If the fox got too close, the hen launched an attack against that predator. Now the hen was willing to sacrifice her life for her brood. Jesus tells us that God's love for us is like that. There have been so many times that I've wanted to gather the children of God together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. Now on the one hand, that's a warm and wonderful simile. We should not, however, misunderstand. The hen can't guarantee her little chicks that they will find absolute safety under her wings. In fact, the mother hen rarely wins a battle with the fox. She's selfless in her devotion to her little ones, but she's no match for the long claws and sharp teeth of the predator. Unless there's some other intervention, the fox will likely kill and eat the hen. And then, if it fits his fancy, the fox will kill and eat the chicks as well. Now, frankly, this is a fitting description for the reality of the world 
the world we live in. God's love for us is unconditional. We can and will be redeemed by the sacrificial love of God in Christ Jesus. God's love does not, however, protect us from all the threats and all the ravages of this world. There are some really miserable things that can and do happen. Alfred Lord Tennyson wrote about this harsh reality of our human condition by saying this, Who trusted God was love indeed, and love is creation's final law. Though nature, red in tooth and claw, with wrath in shriek against his creed. Now, it was in the, the midst of a cold northern Michigan winter, and the inland lakes had been frozen solid for weeks. There were two couples in their early 30s, and each had two children less than 10 years of age. Both families were highly regarded in the community. That 56-mile snowmobile safari around Lake Charlevoix's shoreline seemed a wonderful idea. The fathers had checked their route the previous week. The ice was several feet thick, and it was safe. At least so they thought. They started their adventure early Saturday morning. The parents rode the snowmobiles with the kids towed behind on sleds. The plan was to stop in the little town of East Jordan for breakfast. They were driving on the ice into the rising sun and didn't see that a tributary, the Jordan River, had opened a channel in the ice. The snowmobiles, sleds, and all eight travelers went into the cold, open water. With the added burdens of machinery and heavy, wet winter clothing, both parents in one family and a small child in the other family drowned. What a terrible tragedy. Two families were ripped asunder because of a stream beneath the ice that had intersected with the warm rays of the winter sun. Now to paraphrase, paraphrase Tennyson, God's love may be the final law, but we live in a world where nature is red in tooth and claw, red in tooth and claw. We see this all around us. A tornado, for example, hits a neighborhood and destroys a hundred homes. A hurricane wipes out a shoreline and costs millions to repair. A wildfire decimates a community like Paradise, California and so many other nearby communities. A drought destroys crops and kills trees. A flood floats one home down the river and fills the others with two feet of stinking mud. Nature is red in tooth and claw. Nature is red in tooth and claw. We're always vulnerable to the fox. Of course, not all the threats come from nature. In T.S. Eliot's play, The Cocktail Party, one of the characters is Celia Copplestone. Now, Celia is an accomplished person. She longs for happiness and for meaning in her life. So she's tried all of the social attractions, theater, receptions, cocktail parties, even an affair with Edward, another character in the play. Now, Cecilia has tried it all, but something's missing. She goes to a psychiatrist, and in time, Celia has an insight. The source of the anxiety she's experiencing doesn't lie in the world around her, but as T.S. Eliot causes her to say, there's something wrong with me. There is something wrong with me. Cecilia came to realize that she is the fox in her own life. Human beings are threatened and harmed, not only by outside forces, but by our own decisions. It's another of the givens of the human condition. In the midst of trying to convince Brutus to join the conspiracy against Julius Caesar, Shakespeare caused Cassius to make the same point. The fault, you recall, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. 
The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. In her rather odd spiritual autobiography entitled Traveling Mercies, the popular but unconventional writer Anne Lamott described how, as a child, she had a friend whose father was in prison and whose mother was an alcoholic. Now, Anne says that even though that friend's family was dysfunctional, she preferred spending her time there. Anne explained that there was consistency in that house. Her friend's father was always in prison, and her mother was always drunk. At Anne Lamott's house, she never knew what was going to happen next. By the time she was in her early 30s, Anne had descended into a life of drug addiction, alcohol abuse, and promiscuity. Now, Anne Lamott knew that Cecilia Copplestone meant when she said, there's something wrong with me. And yet Anne also listened to the hope in the next line, P.S. Eliot gave Cecilia. There is something wrong with me that could be put right. There's something wrong with me that could be put right. Whatever's wrong with us can be put right. That is the hope. Now, Anne's life was put right when she came to know Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection. She said that her conversion took place not as an instantaneous leap of faith, but as a series of staggers from what seemed like one place to another. Along the way, there was a minister who listened, really listened. You see, there was a little church in the neighborhood where she heard the music from the street long before she found the courage to enter. Then there came a certain night in the midst of a medical emergency. She was extremely inebriated. It was late at night. She was at home alone. She felt someone with her in the dark. She sensed that there was someone nearby. She claimed she just knew beyond all doubt that it was the presence of Jesus. A week later, she stopped resisting and said, I shouted, I quit. You can come in now. Now, Anne's life was changed. She was set on the right path by the power of the presence of God encountered in the course of an ordinary day. An ordinary day that proved to be one of those third day encounters. You never know just when you or someone you know will say, there's something wrong with me, but I believe that it can be set right. It truly can. But it takes one of those third day encounters. Fortunately, as Amos Wilder put it, retell, renew the event in these planetary years. For we were there, and God is here. It is always the third day. Thanks be to God. Amen and amen. Mm -hmm. 